Perfect. Great. Deb, welcome. Uh, where are you today? I am in Washington, D.C. Excellent. Just down the road. Um, now, I, I have all kinds of questions that I use to get people to uh, introduce themselves. Um, what I'd like to ask you is, for the year ahead, 2020, what are the big things you're going to be working on and thinking about? Okay, so I am going to be working with Credential Engine to really increase credential transparency, not only in the US, but also probably globally. Um, we'll start working on that this year, but I think I probably need to unpack that and, and say what I mean by credentials and transparency. And so, right, should I do that? But before you do that, before you do that, let me just ask, are you gonna do this all from DC or are you gonna be traveling a lot? I'll be traveling some, maybe not a lot. There's a lot going on right here in DC with the Department of Ed and Commerce and National Higher Ed Organizations. So a lot of what I'm working on makes sense right here in DC, which is good. Mm, absolutely. Well, we're and of course, can be done remotely like this. So, mm -hmm. well, that may be the 21st century. So, so tell us, what do you mean by credentials, and what do you mean by transparency? Okay, so. Credentials, um, I'm referring to all different types of credentials. So most people think about degrees, but I'm referring to degrees, diplomas, certificates, certifications, licensures, um, badges, and really any documentation from an authoritative source about a learning achievement. And so that would include internships, apprenticeships, uh, civilian and military and community training programs mm, mm. so that people have some form of documentation of what they've learned. Mm -hmm. And increasingly that's digital, digital credentials and we want those to be interoperable. So these are not just academic, but they also include military, so governmental as well as business and nonprofit generated? Yep. Wow, this is yep. the whole world of credentials. This is huge. It is, and um, research that we completed last fall shows that there are currently about 738,000 credentials offered just in the U.S. Wait, how many? 738,000. Wow, and, and how, many, how many types of credentials is there? Well, that includes um, about 10 different categories that we do the analysis on. And in each category, there's a whole bunch of variety, right? Right. Wow. Right. And so much variety that, you know, most people really can't understand how to navigate through this environment. And yet people need to have multiple credentials because their lives and their careers are rapidly changing. And so they know they need documentation of their skills but it's really hard to understand what credentials are valuable and what they include and, and all of that. So, you know, very good. Um, that tells us a lot. And on top of that, you said transparency. Now, I, if I've got my, my diploma or if I've got my transcript, that looks pretty clear to me. Uh, what's, the, what's the transparency we're missing? It looks pretty clear. It's like hanging on your wall, right? It's real valuable there. <laughs> um, you go to put it, you know, on your resume or in your LinkedIn profile, you could say whatever the heck you want. And it may or may not be accurate. And it may or may not tell an employer or someone else what you what you actually know and can do, right? So that's where new technologies can really help us. So a credential engine, that's our mission, credential transparency. Mm. Uh, we're a nonprofit. Mm. We've been founded by um, education and government and quality assurance and business organizations coming together and saying, let's have a unified way of describing all different types of credentials. And that's the credential transparency description language which is, um, it's a metadata language, a schema for linked open data about all different types of credentials to make them available as verified digital records, but also to make this information about credentials available and linked to all different kinds of um, information on the web. I, I have so many questions, um, my gosh. And, um, but let me just say, first of all, Everybody involved in this conversation 
your questions are the important ones. I would love to hear from you. Um, Me too. At no, at no time should you feel embarrassed. If you have a really basic question, believe me, I've got a couple of kindergarten level questions I want to ask. Um, please feel free to, to put them out there. If you have examples, if you'd like to ask how this can work, this is your form and we'd love to hear from you. Let me, let me just kick things off. I just have a, a couple of questions along the way. You're describing a, a language. Is that, so are, are you basically helping create a new standard language for describing credentialing that's human and machine readable? Yes. And for those in the audience, um, it's, it's um, harmonized with schema.org. So if you think about the schema of how all different types of entities are represented on the web so that search engines can find them, so that all different types of systems can make sense of the relationships between those data elements. Um, but this is a, a schema.org tends to be very general and high level because it's serving high level use cases across the globe. Um, Credential Engine is also designed, uh, I'm sorry, the Credential Transparency Description Language developed by Credential Engine um, is, is also designed from the beginning to be global, but it supports much richer and more specific credential and competency use cases with about 450 different terms that you use to describe not only the credentials, but also the learning opportunities, the competencies, the assessments, the quality assurance structures, costs, earnings, outcomes, mm. jurisdiction, all of those different types of things are structured linked data in CTDL. Wow, so including earnings, I mean, that's this is really extensive. Mm -hmm. And because it, no credential has to have all these fields filled in, right? They can only be right. one. Right, the, um, the required minimum data is pretty minimum because we want to get this to scale as quickly as possible. And so we have um, an open, freely available credential registry where any credential issuer can publish their credentials. Ooh. And so the minimum data for um, publishing your credentials to the registry is pretty minimal, but we encourage everyone to move up to the benchmark level, which is the, the richer, more complete, information that's going to make this data more valuable. How many fields is the uh, minimum for benchmark? Um, the, the minimum is probably about 10 fields. Mm -hmm. It's not very many. And then the benchmark varies depending on the type of credential. This sounds kind of just, just a stray observation. It reminds me a bit of Dublin Core. Yes. Mm -hmm. In fact, Stuart Sutton, who um, is the, the genius of Dublin Core, is one of our key advisors. Oh, excellent. Mm -hmm. excellent. Uh, if you don't know Dublin Core, it's a metadata standard, everybody that uh, is used in the library world. And famously, it's not named after Dublin, Ireland, but after Dublin, Ohio, which is a little trivia detail that's always fun to have. I didn't know that. That's great. Uh, Dublin, Ohio is pretty cold today, I think. Uh, we do have one question that just came in, uh, and this is from the uh, awesome Julie Uranus. And let me just... Uh, Publish this so you, you put this up so that you can all see it. So Julie asks, I'm interested in the carrots and sticks that will be deployed to get institutions and educational partners to list their 7,000 K credentials. Are the other than state partners, what's your roadmap for expanding? Um, so I should probably first explain what Julie means by state partners. Um, a lot of our focus has been at the state level. We're currently working with 16 states and the LA region um, with probably six or eight more states very interested in coming on board soon. And what we're doing with work is working with state level agencies who have credential transparency problems that they're trying to solve. So Julie, this is to your point about carrots, right? They have a problem, they need to solve it and CTDL can help. Um, one example of that type of problem is that um, states manage ETPLs, education training provider lists, that are eligible for federal funds from WIOA. And in many cases at the state level, those ETPLs don't have good data structures for communicating with um, 
educational data, different kinds of training programs, and, um, and also regional needs, you know, like workforce development initiatives. So we can work with them. And even if the only thing they do is use CTDL to get some unified descriptions of their ETPL credentials, that is a good example of a really valuable thing. Most states are going further than that. And even publishing all of their publicly available data about credentials to the, creden to the credential registry at the state level. Um, so some of those same, some of those same problems are also true for systems. We're working with some university systems where they don't necessarily have the, this is, sounds like a surprise, but it's not if you're working in those systems, they don't always have uniform credential data across the, the state university systems, or maybe the, you know, the universities and the community colleges let alone training and certification and apprenticeship programs that are outside those higher ed institutions. So uh, some of the carrots are just better communication, cost savings, better data infrastructure, um, and other carrots, especially for individual institutions or even programs within institutions are about visibility, having a better way of describing what your credentials are and what competencies they include and um, making your data about your credentials uh, more findable um, by search engines with the structured linked data. Well, that's a very, very rich answer um, to a, a fantastic question. Um, thank you very much, uh, Julie. Um, did, you, did you want to know about sticks also, Julie? <laughs> she did ask about sticks. She did ask about sticks. Um, I think that in some cases, um, partly because of the cost savings, you're gonna see a top-down approach that says, credential issuer, you have to provide your credential data in this format in order to be in this data structure. Um, and so that would be a forcing mechanism for institutions to, um, Organize. They might not even have that data, right? So to organize that data and get it into CTDL and get it into the reporting structure that works. Now, let me anticipate a possible stick to come. Uh, do you think state governments will be able to use this um, to try to incentivize or even compel at least public universities and colleges to participate? Yes. Okay. Um, and, and part of that is um, consumer protections, accountability to stakeholders, and some other really obvious reasons yeah. why public institutions are accountable. And therefore, it's not unreasonable to expect them to provide credential data that can be compared across different types of credentials. Thank you. Again, great question, Julie. She always asks great questions. <laughs> Um, and now we have another question that came up. This is a simpler one from Angela Velez Solik, uh, who asks, what initiated this project on your end? I, I think in part, that's how'd you get involved? Oh, for well, so let me say a little bit about the origins of Credential Engine and mm -hmm. then talk about my involvement. So it started as um, a research project at George Washington University um, to see whether or not there you know, was anything like this somewhere else in the world, which there's not, mm. and um, whether or not it would be feasible to set up something like a credential registry and actually have unique identifiers, each individual credential competency and credentialing organization, and what would be the benefits of that. So it started as a as a research project um, has gotten foundation funding from um, many different funders and that that funding continues. I'm not gonna try to list our funders because I'll forget someone and then I'll be in trouble. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and um, how did I come to that? So I've always been a futurist. And when I saw this initiative, I thought, wow, that's, really smart and really ambitious. 
So I started following it from the beginning. Um, at the time I was working on um, badges and other innovative credentials. Mm -hmm. And I was a volunteer in the work groups and actually helped develop the credential transparency description language as a volunteer. And then I made a career transition this year and um, now I'm there full time, which is awesome. Oh, it does sound awesome. Um, as one of futurists to another, I'm delighted to hear it. Yeah. We have a, a, another detailed question um, that comes from, uh, let's see, uh, this is from Rob uh, Peregudoff, um, who asks, hang on, let me just put this up here. Are your discussions technology and vendor agnostic? Good question, Rob. Brian's discussions or the... Um, Are your the, discussions at the Credential Engine? Um, well, technology agnostic, vendor agnostic, yes. Technology agnostic, it, not completely because we have a strong bias to linked open data. We think that for data to be powerful, it needs to be interoperable not only in closed data systems, but also in open data systems. And so um, that's a very strong bias of ours. CTDL has been designed that way from the beginning. The credential, the credential registry posts everything to the web as linked open data. Now, data in the credential registry can be in a community that is closed. For example, a Navy project that we're working on right now is in a Navy specific part of the credential registry, but it's still in linked open data. So any parts of that data that they want to expose to the world, they can. So that's really important to us. Um, vendor neutral, yes. And we would love for more vendors to get actively involved in this space. I saw a few in the participants and this is, this is your call to action because this is um, a rapidly changing arena where the demand is gonna be growing exponentially. And so we want to, we already are working with uh, a number of tech vendors, which again, I won't name because I don't want to <laughs> forget one, but um, SIS, badge platforms, LMSs, um, various types of university cataloging and credentialing systems, um, as well as HR systems, all should be able to use some pretty straightforward methods to use our APIs to publish credentials and competencies to the registry. Well, that's a really, really um, incisive question and a very detailed response. Thank you uh, to both of you. Um, what you, if you're new to the forum, what you're seeing so far are um, questions that people have published their text questions. Now what I'd like to do is uh, introduce a video question. Uh, and this is from uh, the wonderful Tom Hames in uh, the Houston area. Tom, how are you doing? Oh, hanging in there. <clears throat> a little rough around the edges today. Oh, man. <clears throat> well, um, make it. Um, so my question is this. You seem to be assembling, I mean, this is a tremendous project in terms of the scope of it and kind of boggles the mind in that sense. Um, but there's, a, there's an awful lot of wet width to this. But what I'm wondering is how do we use this data to assemble a more in-depth uh, vision of what a potential employee, post student, whatever credentialed individual actually brings to the table? Mm. Um, I'm was recently reading about the uh, University of Sydney's uh, uh, soft skills addition to their transcripts. And uh, I found that very interesting because, you know, I find that, you know, uh, credentials are based ultimately on grades and completing and checking boxes and going through a bunch of other stuff, which generally has very little to do with actual learning. And uh, so my concern is, of course, that you build a, 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 this is important and necessary, but it, you're building a, a, a canvas of something that doesn't necessarily give us a really good feel for what the student is. So my question is, how do you address that issue? Sure. So that's why one of the key elements of credentials in the CTDL is the competencies. 
Mm. Now, mind you, not every credential ins issuer actually has well-defined competencies that they can include in their credentials. So competencies are not part of the, the minimum required data, but we're strongly encouraging everyone to include those competencies. Um, because the, the competencies are the level that maps to the job skills in various types of career progression requirements. And so if you don't have that level of richness in the data, like you said, Tom, then it becomes, well, it's a more efficient way of managing high level data about credentials, but does it really help individuals? Does it help um, employers find individuals with the right talents? Um, now, let me back up for a minute and, and note that the credential registry does not collect or issue credentials to specific people. So we don't have any personally identifiable information in the registry. This is the abstracted information about the credentials and the, and the competencies and the, the various types of organizations. So, so you're essentially me measuring or evaluating the program, not the individual. That That's right. Assessment? That's right. Uh, uh. But now with digital credentials, um, badges, comprehensive learner records, interoperable learning record, universal learning records, there's a whole bunch of names for these now, right? Um, but the key thing is that as we have more and more digital credentials, our, what we're advocating for, again, this call to action for all of you, um, is that those credentials and competencies be published to the registry so that then you get a globally unique identifier, the CTID. That can be embedded in that digital credential. And then that linked open data is connected out to all of the information about the credentials, the competencies, the QA, the assessments, the learning program, what courses as much detail as that credential provider chose to include through the linked open data. And then because it's linked, it can link out to all kinds of other rich data. So say for example, the credential provider has a, date, has a link to the QA organization, and then there's all of that rich information about the QA organization and their QA processes. So I have a really nasty question. Are there any plans to hook this to a rating system so employers can sit there and go, oh, well, they say they teach these skills, but the person we hired has no idea wow. what they're doing in this area? <laughs> well, that's, that's a really valuable question, actually, because um, right now what we do, not we, Credential Engine, but we as a, you know, as ecosystems, those employment outcomes are based on some pretty rudimentary measures, right. right? To the extent you they have to start somewhere, out. right? You got to start somewhere. Is this person employed after they got this credential? Are they employed in the occupation to which this credential is aligned? Um, do we have information about their earnings? Do we have any longitudinal data to know whether or not that was actually an improvement in their earnings? Those are pretty basic things, but um, this type of rich data transparency can give us actually those loops, those feedback loops. Assuming right? you have the data coming in. One of the, one exactly. of the problems we have here in Texas is that that kind of data is completely untracked and, and therefore we have no idea about what's actually happening when they come out. Uh, I mean, other than self-reporting of some sort, but there's really no statewide right. system like some other states have that actually tracks that sort of stuff. Well, and this can, this can actually shortcut that because yeah. employers are also organizations. They can be entities in the credential registry and they can um, make endorsements of credentials. So in mm -hmm. that case, they're not endorsing a specific person who has that credential, but they can say, we have one or more employees who have this credential and they could choose to endorse that credential based on that. Um, but they can also provide feedback to, um, so a, a lot of educational institutions have ways of collaborating with local or regional employers, right? Um, but this can actually provide a communication mechanism for that to say, mm -hmm. look, 
you say you have these competencies in this credential. We actually hired some people who have this credential and they don't, or they do and that's good, but we also want these other competencies included in your programs. So it can, it can open up that kind of dialogue without having to have a state level um, system that does that. Great, thank you. Thank you for those great. That's, that's a great start. Hope you feel better, Tom. Oh, thanks. I'll be fine. If um, so, again, that's a video uh, question. Uh, easy to do. Um, so, if you've got a camera, if you've got a mic, and um, and you're ready to go, you don't have to be in Texas. You can be anywhere, and uh, and we'll put you up on stage. In fact, we have another person here from a, another friend of the program for a long time ago. Uh, let me bring up the awesome Michael Berman. Happy New Year. Hi, Michael. Hey, Deborah. Hey, Brian. Where are you today, Michael? I'm in Long Beach, California. Fantastic. And um, so, uh, and and you're you're in your new um, uh, uh, lair that has um, reasonable bandwidth, except when it doesn't. It has very good bandwidth. I'm, I'm not yeah. sure what it switches today, but um, yeah, it's very good. Only when you do a webinar, there's a problem. Otherwise, it's perfect. It's good. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Good, good to see you both. So, Deborah, you answered some of my question already, but I'm, I'm trying to understand. I, I need someone to do a whole workshop to, to help me understand the, the whole ecosystem that's growing up around this area of credentialing. Um, I mean, I think that what you said about um, um, you're, you're evaluating the credentials, not the people, is very helpful, and I, that, that kind of something clicked for me when you said that. Um, I'm, I'm trying to understand the relationship between what you're doing and, um, for example, what IMS Global is doing with the, the comprehensive learner record. And as you mentioned, the other there's several other initiatives that are um, going down similar tracks with coming from a little bit different directions. I'm hoping some of this will converge because when I look at for the Cal State system, you know, we, we, we can't follow, we can only follow so many of these initiatives. And so hopefully they'll converge somewhat. But I do think that, uh, if I let me let me put it in my words and help me understand if this is what you're saying. So what you this this ID number that um, you're developing that's a uh, that represents a unique identifier that maps to a particular competency. The idea is that becomes then a data point within student credentials. So then <clears throat> student credentials is supposed to just having um, only having uh, sort of uh, general descriptors that an institution or might be self-described as a competency. You've got some that are really pinned down that are well described in some publicly accessible open metadata. And that's really the, the piece of the puzzle that you're trying to solve. Is that is that how I understand it? Yes, and to grow that publicly available metadata so that there's um, so that there's more, right? I mean, mm -hmm. to provide comparisons, for example. Um, but to your the first part of your question about ecosystems. Um, that's deliberately plural because there are all different types of ecosystems growing up around this. So for example, our regional initiative in the LA area is focused primarily on the retail and hospitality sector. Mm -hmm. And so that's, um, you know, say specific programs within community colleges, within a region, collaborating with specific employers to develop the, the needed workforce for that particular region. And that's a very viable and, and important example of an ecosystem, but there's many others. In some cases, it might even be um, a specific badging initiative at an institution that provides the, um, people call them soft skills, but I hate that phrase, 21st century skills, durable skills, cross-cutting competencies. Mm -hmm. And they that might be a badging initiative at a specific institution with local employers to say, well, does someone actually come out of this program with teamwork skills, for example? So anyway, there are many different examples of ecosystems, but then to your point about um, how some of these things are converging, so I, I totally hear you about all these different organizations doing different things. If you want to, um, if you want to go straight to where there's focus that's bringing these things together, go to the T3 Innovation Network, um, which is organized by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation. And what that's done has um, brought together over the last couple of years, people from 
education, training, business, government, military, and looked at the, um, the convergence of how we can use 21st century technologies, especially linked open data, and um, solve some of the problems in the, the talent marketplace, right? So mm -hmm. that's what, how do people represent their own skills and accomplishments and be able to use those and have them, you know, like competencies as currency, right? So anyway, there's, um, there's a bunch of different work groups there. You can choose the one that is um, most relevant for your particular interest. You can just follow along with all of them. Credential Engine is involved in all of them that touch on what we're doing. IMS is also involved there. And the specific touch point between um, IMS, Comprehensive Learner Records, the CLR, and Credential Engine, well, I'm a, I'm a touch point because I was actually one of the um, co-leads on the development mm -hmm. of, of the CLR. Yeah, I thought um, you were involved in that, yeah. Yeah, and but, but part of what we did when we developed the CLR standard is that we harmonized it already with Credential Engine. So if the CLR is a container that is going to issue those structured digital records to individuals, then those individual records within there can include the CTID. And then you don't have to embed a lot of extra data in that CLR unless you want to, because that's, that data is all connected to it via the CTID. Same thing with other digital credential technologies. Open badges, um, the T3 Innovation Network is launching a, a set of pilots this spring on ILRs, which are very similar, but they're more clearly designed specifically with employment um, feedback loops involved. So, We had a quick question about that. It came from the, the chat box, which was, is the ID to the credential or to the person who earned that credential? The, well, you're, still, you're also gonna need, you know, the personally identifiable information for yeah. that individual, but that's not the part that we do, right? So, and there's actually a T3 innovation um, work group about that, okay. about um, personal identifiers. What we do with the credential transparency identifier, the CTID, is the different data points in the registry, like a credential or a com competency or a credential issuer, um, that record in the credential registry has that um, global unique identifier that can be embedded in any digital system and at any point link out to all that data via the web. Thank you, thank you. We have more questions coming in. Michael, thank you for that one. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. See you, see you soon. Thanks, Michael. Uh, we have uh, a whole bunch of people who are asking. I just want to. It's okay. I'll, I'll I'll read your question out. Um, Kelly and um, and Chris Sessoms actually had a very similar question. So let me just put this up on um, um, on the screen. Um, how do credential? How do colleges and universities start participating in the credential engine and CETL? Okay, so that's actually really simple. Go to credentialengine.org, and um, You'll see there a lot of resources to help you learn more about what we do and CTDL. And you'll also see right on the page um, a, a link to the credential registry where you can go and create an account and start publishing information about your credentials. And we provide a variety of assistance with that um, we try to make it as do-it-yourself as possible because we want it to be very scalable. So we have um, open source resources, um, their community commons license. So also if you want to become an advocate for this and learn more about it yourself, but then help other people learn how to do it, better yet. So there's, um, there's how-to guides, there's fact sheets, there's um, a very straightforward process for creating an account and publishing your credentials to the registry. And of course you could reach out to us also 
Um, we have a small staff. We're always eager to help, and we're particularly eager to help people who want to help other people. So, well, and I think we're we're glad to do our role here in the forum. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, another question. Thank yes, you. Yes, it's free. I see that in the chat. Can you say that again? It's free. There's no charge for um, for using the registry, for using any of the documentation, for using CTDL. Um, I, I don't think you can say free often enough. Um, free, free. <laughs> we have Phil Lowell. Hi, Phil. <laughs> hey, Phil. Good to see you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, hi, Deb. Hopefully, I'll see you next week. Um, oh, good. Uh, the question I had is actually around the ability to s maintain or exert um, selective disclosure of the elements from a credential that's in the registry when shared with others. That is to say, um, I might want someone to um, know I have a credential for something, but I may not want to describe anything more about it unless there is a direct one-on-one -on -one connection between us? Um, that's a good question. I don't actually know the answer to that question. I'd have to ask our tech people. Um, and since I probably will see you soon, I'll, I'll track that down and find out. Okay. I, it, the, the question comes up because at least from what we're seeing, there's an increasing interest in sort of the general topic of selective disclosure where the individual retains the ability to say what about themselves they want to, to share. And in a search context, for example, if you're in the registry, you may want to, to be able to disclose that you got a degree from Cal State, but nothing more at that point, unless there is further interest or, or um, follow up from the person who's inquiring or the, yeah. or the vendor that, or the, the employer that's inquiring. Right, so let's let's make a distinction between the individual record of the credential that's issued to the individual, and certainly that type of selective disclosure is is critically important there. Like you might want to say, "I got this degree, but I'm not going to disclose my grades," for example, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then the degree could be verified, but not more specific information. But if the um, if you're talking about the motivations of the credential provider and the data that they're providing about the credential, right? Maybe they have, for example, some um, deep and fairly complex information about earnings that they've captured, not about earnings of individual people, right? But about the earnings outcomes for that credential in aggregate. Maybe they produce that information for certain types of initiatives, but they don't want it publicly available on the web. Um, I'm, I just don't know whether or not the registry out of the box supports that type of um, disclosure. Hmm. Uh, it looks like somebody has, oh, somebody's got a link to credential engine in general, not that specific point. But um, that said, um, I did say free, 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 but we can also provide uh, paid services. So if the credential registry doesn't support that out of the box, but an institution or a state system or whoever wanted to do that, then that's the type of um, sp uh, specialized services that we can provide um, via a contract. And is there, can I ask one more question? Is that okay? Yeah. Um, well, is I don't there, know, Brian. It's okay with me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Brian's gone, so yeah, go ahead. <laughs> well, yes. Um, the, the question comes up with respect to the recent introduction of the California um, uh, Consumer Privacy uh, Act, where individuals, organizations that are collecting data about people need to be able to, well, within qualified by how many how many individuals are collecting data about and things like that. But um, assuming that you fall into their general category of, of coverage, um, are what impact or have you actually analyzed the impact of what you need to be able to uh, provide and or do uh, to the individual that says, yes, I do want my data included in aggregations or don't want my data included in aggregations of various sorts and that and that kind of thing. 
Um, that's a really important question, but it's not one that we at Credential Engine work with directly because we don't collect any personally identifiable information. And we also don't collect that data that is then analyzed in aggregate. It would be the credential issuer who collects that data and, um, and decides how to analyze it for yeah. the earnings, the aggregate earnings outcome, right. for example. It, it's probably worth checking in, into that a little more insofar as the attorney general in California has said that derived data from individuals' contributions from an institution or otherwise still constitute things that the individual should be able to withdraw from. Um, yes, so that's for example, true, but we just don't, we don't collect those data right. sets. No, but you right. might redistribute some of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it, the, the case in point came from indeed.com, which their response to that was, if you want to have the, da the derived data that we create about you, all of the people registering at Indeed uh, withdrawn from your contribution to that withdrawn, then you can do that, but you also have to delete your account. You can't use our service anymore. Uh, 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 Phil, is that the uh, new California law that just- That's correct. Yeah. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, I appreciate it, and I really look forward to seeing you again. Okay, see you soon. Uh, friends, we have about 10 minutes left, and we have a whole bevy of questions coming in. Um, Deb, how are you holding up? Is this good? Oh, great. Yeah. Oh, great. Uh, well, we've got a couple more uh, text questions, which I'll put up here. So here's one from, um, uh, from Doyle, which is, what is the validation process in determining the quality of the program credential? So quality is relative, right? Quality by what criteria and for whose purposes. And so our aim, so first of all, let me say that Credential Engine was founded by multiple types of organizations, including QA organizations. And we have an active advisory group now of um, quality assurance organizations, not only from higher ed, but also from other types of bodies. And so we are, we are deeply concerned and committed to the question of quality. Mm -hmm. However, we are, not a, we are not the quality police. Our aim is to encourage everyone to publish as much information as possible, including about the quality assurance organizations that oversee this credentialing institution and the programs that produce these credentials and to provide a lot of really rich data so that different stakeholders can make their own determinations about the quality. What might be high quality for an employer might be different for someone who is seeking to pursue a different, a particular credential might be different for someone who is providing funding to that organization. And so um, our focus is really on providing data for people to be able to make quality determinations, not for us to make those, not for us to make those determinations. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Doyle, for the really cool question. Uh, we have, this is the part of the program where we start to look forward to the future. And already we've been doing that. You've been describing a, an ambitious project and with a roadmap and a, uh, a, lot, a lot of directions to proceed in. We have a couple of questions that have come up, and uh, I'd like to share these. We have one from Charles Finley, um, who asks, will the CTID force replacing grades on traditional transcripts for individuals? Um, yeah, I'll bring that back No. Up. So um, technologies overlap, right? traditional transcripts are not going away anytime soon. Um, I was in Penn Station recently and they have phone booths there, yeah. with telephones in them, <laughs> right? So um, this is going to be for probably quite some time, a parallel between traditional transcripts being issued and being issued in more updated digital ways and for new digital transcripts to emerge alongside those where people might get both. And then maybe they'll get the traditional embedded in a digital container. And then they'll have 
some things that are only in digital credentials. Mm -hmm. And so um, the CTID is about us moving into that future. And it's about the identifiers for those credentials and competencies, not for a specific grade. And that's also, it's worth noting, that's a CTID for a particular version of that credential. So say, for example, I got a cybersecurity certificate in 2020, that's going to be a different CTID than when that program changes significantly and is offered in 2022. Sure. So in that case, you wouldn't change the grades or change the fact that that person achieved that 2020 credential, but you would have a different basis for comparison, right? Because you would be able to see what characteristics are different via the CTDL between the newer version and the prior version. Does that make sense? It makes sense to me. It's a, it's a, it's a tricky moving target that you're trying to pin down. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, speaking of which, we're not trying to pin it down. We're just going with that moving target. <laughs> in terms of the language, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and a little, a little broader. If we open the lens a little further, we have a question from Ben, who asks, from your point of view, for how much longer does the bachelor's degree have relevancy? Oh, that's a loaded question. Um, I, I think that um, traditional degrees, bachelor's, masters, PhDs. Um, MDs, et cetera, those will continue to have relevancy for the foreseeable future. Um, however, I think that as we get more information about the, um, the outcomes for individuals associated with what are now called alternative credentials, which is kind of crazy because alternative credential way outnumber degrees. Degrees are your measure of traditional credentials. Sure. Um, as we get more and more data about those and can use them more effectively because we actually see how they build in career pathways, more and more people are going to opt for those, right? They're, they're typically gonna be shorter, more targeted, more geared toward the specific outcomes that an individual wants, including this particular um, move in my in my career ladder or lattice. So um, I think fewer people will get bachelor's degrees, but I don't think that's a bad thing. That'll be a big step if it has if it does occur. Yeah. Um, thank you, Ben. Um, thank you for that uh, very foresightful question. Actually, a lot of people will probably not be happy to hear me say that I think fewer people get past those degrees. But, you know, it's in, in this world of very rapidly changing careers, more people are going to need credentials and they may or may not need bachelors. So we had a, a follow up question from, uh, from Phil right along those lines. And I think this will be the last one for, uh, for today. Um, uh, Phil asks, to what extent do you think credentials in the absence of skills described will persist? Well, one of the reasons that degrees persist and are still a primary sorting mechanism in applicant screenings for jobs is because people assume, for example, hiring managers assume that they know what skills that credential represents, right? So there, are, and that's true for many different types of credentials. And in some cases, for example, like certifications and licensures, um, the, the, they do actually represent a very specific set of skills. So um, certain types of assumptions are gonna continue, but more and more alternative credentials are going to become successful credentials because they represent the yeah. skills and competencies they include. So they could just outcompete the uh, less mm -hmm. ones. Yeah. Um, Deb, I, I, have, I have to pause now because we're right at the end of our hour. I know. And we have just barreled along at top speed. Um, so many fantastic questions. Let, let me just quickly ask, what's the best way for people to uh, catch up with you in person? Uh, is it uh, your Twitter account, Ariadne4444? Uh, yeah, that's one way too. Great. 
Great news. Or just go to the Credential Engine website and there was a link on the Shindig page to mm -hmm. uh, my email address there. So so we can we can follow up with you there. Um, thank you so much. This has been fantastic. You've really given us a deep insight into this project, which is one way forward for the future of higher education. Thank you so much. Well, thanks for having me here. It's been great. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, and don't go away, friends, because I have to tell you about what happens next. Uh, we have, next week, we have a tutorial um, uh, forum with Ruben Puentadura, where he's going to walk us through the SAMR method, which is, again, this very important method for describing how teachers and instructors can change what they do to enhance it in the work of technology. Um, Ruben is a fantastic facilitator, a, a, just a great thinker, um, and I'm really, really looking forward to this. And you can find out more just by going to shindig.com slash login slash event slash SAMR. Now, if you want to catch up on that session afterwards or this session afterwards or any number of nearly 200 sessions, just head to the video archive, tinyurl.com slash FDF archive. And if you'd like to keep talking about all this great stuff, including credentials, and where they're headed, just join us on Twitter using the hashtag FTTE. You'll see there's already been a bunch of conversation today. Head to our um, our Facebook group or our LinkedIn group or our Slack channel, and we'll be delighted to hear from you. In the meantime, thank you all so much, friends, today for fantastic questions. I really appreciate it. I think we all learned a great deal. We'll see you next time online. Take care. Bye-bye, and Happy New Year. <laughs>